So we're going to finish out the U-shag and add in K, and then next time we'll go over several examples like endothermic reactions, exothermic reactions, and so on. So we're going to finish this whole uh, statistical thermodynamic uh, derivation of all of these macroscopic properties that we're used to hearing about using a quantum view of nature. So today we're going to cover these last three and then also the equilibrium constant tacked on at the end. So we've I'll just kind of zip through these first few because it's a repeat of the same slides, but just sort of just to continue to build that ramp. So uh, this is, the, again, that expectation value for internal energy. We just take those probabilities of each quantized state times the energy of each state. Sum those together. You can only use this if you can count the number of levels, right? If you're at 10 to the 30, probably not good to use this equation. You would use that equipartition uh, theorem, like 3 halves RT for each of the degrees of freedom that you have. Then uh, with that internal energy, you can derive all of the other thermodynamic constants. But we're going to be covering the A and the G today, the Helmholtz energy and the Gibbs energy. And then we're going to see, once we have the Gibbs energy, if we have a reaction, so Gibbs energy for products and a Gibbs energy for reactants, we can take the difference and get the delta G and then we can use that to get the equilibrium constant. So here's our simple partition function calculation for that three level system. We have this in uh, earlier lectures. Uh, this is again that strangely worded problem where your energy levels are given in terms of temperature. And that kind of makes the calculation simple if you just recognize that K's or R's would cancel in that calculation. Uh, and so you can just do the E to the temperature of the energy level divided by the temperature of the system. And then we have that uh, actual calculation of the internal energy. Here now we have to take into account that R because we need actual energy values here. So we wanted our energies in joules per mole. So we used R. Okay. And we use this one. Per mole Kelvin. And so when you multiply by the temperature, you get the energy. So we end up with 88.3 joules per mole. Uh, just for grins, we calculated what if we had three degenerate levels in the second state and two degenerate levels in the top state, and our energy jumped up to 141. I'm trying to remember, it's been several days. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it jumped to 141 from 88, and we didn't change the temperature. And so we kind of connected that to heat capacity because you could put more energy in a system to reach the same temperature. So it, it had a higher capacity for energy or heat. And then we developed the, the uh, entropy. We talked about Boltzmann and this idea of the weighting factors kind of being related to the probabilities of being in each of those states. And, and then we started using that. So we calculated the entropy. We had to use the internal energy. So this is all based upon having Q. You have to have Q and you have to have that expectation value, that internal energy, before you can calculate the entropy. And then using the internal energy, we were able to calculate the enthalpy. So we just take that, again, that gas constant times the temperature, add that in to the internal energy, and then we get the enthalpy. And we can take the changes in, uh, in reactions, and we could get a delta H, obviously. We get a, an enthalpy change with a reaction. And y'all did that in the lab on Monday. There's a few people still to do that today. And, uh, and so that's what you'll be calculating. Now let's get into the Helmholtz energy. So just a show of hands, has anybody heard of the Helmholtz energy until this class? At all? Okay, so that's a, that's a failure of academics, <laughs> but it, that's why we have this class, right? Um, so what in the world, I've ne you know, until you get here, you're like Helmholtz energy, I've never heard of this. How many people have heard of Gibbs energy, right? All through all of your courses, the Gibbs energy change tells you what, what do we mainly use the Gibbs energy change for? Right, is it spontaneous or not? If it's a negative Gibbs energy change in a reaction, it's spontaneous. And so it's gonna proceed in the forward direction without any external assistance. So you put the reactants together, if there's a negative Gibbs energy change, that reaction will happen spontaneously. It may be slow, it may be fast, that's kinetics. We won't know anything about the kinetics from the thermodynamics. So like rusting of iron versus burning of iron, you know, they're both the same, both the same change. They're both spontaneous, but it's a surface area effect. 
And so you can have iron objects out in the atmosphere and they'll oxidize on the surface, but then the whole surface is covered in an oxide layer and then oxygen can't reach the bare metal below. So essentially the process stops. But if you take powdered iron and disperse it into the atmosphere, it can burn vigorously. And in fact, uh, they can do that with aluminum. Aluminum has a more uh, spontaneous reaction with oxygen to make aluminum oxide. And that's how they make these blast enhanced explosives. I don't know if you've heard of those, the, the daisy cutter, the bunker buster, all these kinds of big explosives that they, they take a conventional chemical explosive like TNT or C4, some mix of tetral and some other kinds of chemical explosives, and they disperse aluminum powder or put powder around that explosive. And so what it does is it just disperses powdered metal into the atmosphere. And then that powder metal burns in the atmosphere and then creates a really long lasting shock wave. And all it takes is just a few ounces of overpressure on a wall or a glass pane to, to break it, to push it down. And so it's really about that overpressure. And so if you could create a, a, a soft shock wave and just create a lot of pressure, you're going to knock things over. And so whenever you hear about um, uh, blast enhanced explosives, it's just using delta G and, and powdered metal and putting it out in the atmosphere. So that's a little side trip. But talking about it's very exothermic and very exergonic. We'll learn about that word. That's delta G is negative. Um, but kinetics play a role. And so aluminum, you know, you have aluminum objects around. You're not worried about them blowing the building down. <laughs> but you powderize them and disperse them, then they can burn vigorously to create a shockwave. So, now, where does Helmholtz energy come in? It really comes in in industrial synthesis. Okay. So if you think about the academic, um, you know, synthesis, you know, apparatus that we typically have, you know, we've got a round bottom flask and we've got maybe a condenser up here to keep everything inside, right? Look at that. I'm doing pretty good today. Normally my drawings are unintelligible. Okay, so, so, you know, you'll have the little reflux line here and it'll keep, you know, bubbling away. And what do you see about this apparatus that keeps you safe in the lab? Okay. It's open at the top. It's open at the top. <laughs> That's right. Don't heat a closed container. <laughs> so you don't stick a cork in the top with a thermometer in it, you know, and turn on the heat, uh, which uh, in my freshman uh, lab that happened. The, my lab partner or person next to me, we were making this synthesis and uh, um, it was a really cool freshman lab. It was for chem majors only. So we got to actually do some, some bigger things and we were making an organometallic compound. And uh, so we had all our stuff mixed in there, three neck flask and the condenser and everything. And the person next to me had capped all of the holes. Okay. Yeah. Put on, turn on the heat, you know, <laughs> we're freshmen, right? What are you going to do? And so, uh, I just happened to lean down and look when the little stopper out of the three neck flask popped out with a hose. It had a hose and we had some powder that we were to add later. So she had a little hose and a powder thing like that. And I leaned down and it went and it blew over my head like it landed on the floor over there. It was perfect. It would have hit me right in the ear. Anyway, they were like, what happened? And I was like, you heated a closed container. That's what happened. <laughs> so it drove it into my head. Don't heat a closed container. Um, so, uh, but in industry, they do it all the time. They heat closed containers all the time. And so this is a constant pressure apparatus. So uh, delta P equals zero here. <laughs> okay, so, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the constant pressure apparatus. Um, and, and so it's always at one atmosphere. And so it has a, um, it, uh, volume can fluctuate, right? The level of liquid can go up or down or the volume of the gases can expand out or contract in and so on. Now in industry, they heat a closed container, but it looks like this. Okay. And let's see if I can draw this one, but it's just as good. Okay. It's typically a steel lid and it's surrounded by these little things like this called bolts. <laughs> okay. And they bolt the heck out of that lid. You know, it'll be like 50 bolts across the top. And then they have a pressure transducer in there that tells them what the pressure is. 
and that's a constant volume container. And so the Helmholtz energy tells you if it's going to be spontaneous at a constant volume. So in industry, a chemical engineer, they're going to use A in terms of in, versus G when they're dealing with uh, chemical synthesis. <clears throat> So constant volume, that means delta G equals zero during, for that reaction. And so that's uh, the Helmholtz uh, energy. Now we're calculating the Helmholtz energy for, uh, for our system. This is not a delta. Okay, so that's, it. Look, it's negative, right? But it, that doesn't mean there's anything spontaneous because we won't have any chemical change in our system. We just have a system. If we put this in contact with another system that has degeneracy or something like that, then we have a delta A. So it's the delta A uh, that needs to be positive or negative, just like a delta G. So we're just calculating A for our system. We would calculate another system and thermal contact with this system and see which one is lower and there'd be a delta A going to the lower one that's negative. So we'll calculate some of those, uh, hopefully if we get there in time. So if I get don't get sidetracked on more stories. Mm -hmm. So this is the delta G. This is our academic synthesis, the constant pressure system that I showed, because gases can come in and out. I'm calling it academic synthesis because that's what we teach you here in, in organic and the other classes, but mostly organic, right? <clears throat> because it has a, an open, it's open to the atmosphere. And so here's how you calculate delta G. So we take our entropy term that we had from previous calculations. We take the enthalpy term from previous calculations. Those require the partition function and the internal energy. And so the enthalpy goes here, okay, right there, and the entropy goes here. And that's what I was saying that it's this, um, it's kind of the, what I call the entropy tax, right? So uh, Gibbs energy is the enthalpy or the heat of reaction, but then you subtract this T times the S. And so it's taking away some of that energy um, in terms of entropy. So you don't get all of the energy from the heat of the reaction, you also lose something uh, related to this um, uh, entropy term. And this also is not a delta G, this is just a G. Now if we have in a reaction, if we have delta S and delta H, you could use delta S and delta H to calculate delta G. So you can get to, to G a couple of different ways. Okay. And the same with all of these. If you have delta U, you can ca it calculate your delta H. And so, so here's our summary of, of USHAG for our, our three-level system where we calculated the average Gibbs energy at 25 Kelvin. So these are all our numbers. Okay. It really only becomes interesting to me, though, when you have a in contact with another system. Okay. And so we can, we can play around with this in a second. So let's, but let's look at the Gibbs energy for a second. Let's dive into that one. So there are many different forms of thermodynamic equations. And if you look in the book, I mean, you, you look up Gibbs energy in the book and flip through all the pages, you're going to see all kinds of ways it's calculated. Okay, and so let's play around with uh, some of these. So uh, you could also see the Gibbs energy is calculated using, um, using the Helmholtz energy. So there's a relationship between the Gibbs energy and the Helmholtz energy. Here it is. Now for an ideal gas, that PV term could be substituted, right? So what would we do for that PV term? Well, PV equals NRT, okay? And then NRT, well, the, that NR, that can be broken apart. That R is um, Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann's constant. And then if you have uh, N times Avogadro's number, remember N would be number of moles. So let's say you have uh, one mole 
times the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. It's weird that we never write out particles. I mean, you can if you want, so particles. Then the per moles cancel, and we end up with the number of particles, which is equal to n, without a little subscript. So we could say that this nr, um, this, this n times na is just the number of particles n. And so that's where this went. This PV disappeared and became this NKT using the ideal gas law. Pretty straightforward, okay? I did that because I wanted it to be in, in terms of the Boltzmann's constant here. And then this is the equation for that Helmholtz energy minus KT Lin Q. This is that ensemble Q that we had uh, where it's uh, little Q over N raised to the number of moles. So we did that little side trip uh, in the supplemental material about three lectures ago. And this, this was the substitution for this capital Q. Was the, the partition function raised to the number of particles. Because this was a, a identical particles, you've got um, for the total partition function, each individual partition function is the product of all those individual partition functions. And so if you have the partition function for water and you have 10 water molecules, it would be Q to the 10th power. Okay, so it's the number of particles is the exponent. But because they're identical, you're overcounting. And so you need to reduce the number of uh, events, if you will, from a probabilistic standpoint. And so we divide by that n factorial. Now that's a problem because <clears throat> we, if you try on your calculator to calculate factorial for a mole of particles, you're going to get an error. Like it's almost not calculable. Okay, so there's this thing called Sterling's approximation. So in that that uh, supplemental, we saw Sterling's approximation, and that's how we get rid of this um, this uh, n factorial. So we have this n factorial piece that we're trying to get rid of. For this one, we took the natural log of a fraction. We just split that apart. So we have the natural log of the numerator and then we subtract the natural log of the denominator. And you say, wait a second, subtract, that's a plus. Well, it was negative to begin with, so, so that is a subtraction. And then we still have that NKT on the right. So let's take Sterling's approximation and, and uh, split that apart. So here's Sterling's approximation. We still have this uh, natural log of Q, but this N we brought out front here. And then we have this n factorial, which this is Sterling's approximation. So that's an approximation of that factorial. And it's kt times both of those terms. So we have nkt log of n and then uh, minus nkt. So we have a minus nkt here and a plus nkt here. So those cancel out, actually. So this is... After Sterling's approximation, we've gotten rid of the factorial, so this is good. We can now calculate things for molar quantities of atoms or particles of any type. And now we can combine those logs and make it a fraction again. Okay. So now we have the Q, Q over N, and then we have this NKT up front, which remember up here we had... Uh, This nRT is also uh, nKT. So we can take that nKT and do our substitution back to get to nRT. And then it's a property of the logs that you can take if it's a coefficient here, like this number of moles, you can move it around here and make it a, make it a superscript. Okay, or, or yeah. And so something familiar arises and that is the number of moles as an exponent. We've seen that before. <clears throat> so let's play with that a little bit. If we have this chemical equilibrium, A and B and C and D compounds in equilibrium with each other, the Gibbs energy for delta G would be the, the difference of products minus reactants. So I know the notes, you're, you're gonna be surprised here. This is new, two new slides. But um, 
Let's go ahead and just work our way through this. I'll take my time. I just didn't want to end with the end with that Gibbs energy line, which is the last one of the notes, the previous slide. Uh, I wanted to finish out so we could get to the equilibrium constant. So if we have those individual Gibbs energies, we can put in our RT lin Qs. Okay. We have C moles, and this is the Gibbs energy for C. And we have D moles, and that's the Gibbs energy for D minus A moles and minus B moles and so on. So we have all of these terms. Yeah, it's a pretty long thing to write. I apologize for that. And if you don't get all of it, remember there's a video. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go into the next line. So we could simplify that. If you don't finish the top one, you can maybe just finish the simplified one. We can pull that minus RT out of all of them. And so then we have this uh, natural log of, of, the, of the partition function for C raised to the C power and D to the D power and, and so on. And remember, differences in logs can be written as a, as a uh, fraction. And so we can have the products of these things if they're added together and if they're um, subtracted, we can write them as, as quotients. And so we end up with this. This minus RT is still out front. We've combined all of the natural logs and we have the two products here on top and the two reactants down on bottom. And so therefore then this is the equilibrium constant that we're familiar with. So that is pretty cool. <clears throat> and then we also have that, that um, familiar equation that delta G is minus RT, the natural log of K. I say KP because these are gas phase reactants. And so we're talking about partial pressures here being a, a stand in for the partition function. Um, so for, can you, can you kind of explain the difference between the N versus N subscript A again? Yeah, so in our terminology, this is a good question. N subscript A is Avogadro's number. And then just plain old N is the number of particles. And you get that by multiplying moles. Yeah, moles times Avogadro's number. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and with what he was just asking, I know that there's N subscript A, mm -hmm. then there's little N, which That's, is no more moles. Oh, yeah, let me write that on here, too. <laughs> and then a, a regular N right there with no subscript in its uppercase. What's yes. the... The difference. I mean, how, how to know the difference there? Yeah. So that's uh, these are the three definitions right here. So so the capital N is the number okay. of particles. Yeah. Great questions. And so then we can rearrange and solve for K, where it's that e to the minus delta G over RT. And y'all are going to be doing this in the lab. I mean, in fact, you already did it probably. And so um, <clears throat> we can calculate delta Gs using the Gaussian calculation. Uh, you know, program. Uh, again, we're dealing with gas phase molecules, so, um, you know, it's fairly straightforward. And we can calculate equilibrium constants. Now, this is pretty amazing if you think about it. So let's look at some of this, um, you know, the statistical treatment of quantized states explain the following observations, that, that heat capacity goes to zero as temperature goes to zero. This entropy is a measure of the density of states at a given temperature. So how many, how many uh, energy levels are populated at a given temperature? You know, we, had, uh, we went to degeneracy and our entropy went up, but we were at the same temperature. So we had a higher density of states. So like this term density of states is a really uh, good concept to have in your head. 
So just take on any any energy level diagram, take like a unit of energy, how many states do I have in that chunk? So it's not really like density in terms of volume, mass over volume, but we just say density like a like how much stuff is in a given area or volume. So if on an energy level diagram, we're talking about how many states are there per joule, if you will. And so that that this entropy is a measure of that density of states at a given temperature. How many population states do I have? And then spontaneous change of this delta G is driven statistically. We can look at just the population of the energy levels and the entropy and, and we can drive or see that reactions are driven statistically by connecting this to the statistics of the, um, of the quantized energy level diagram. And then chemical equilibrium depends upon these partition functions of reactants and products. So we could just take the partition function for our products and divide it by the partition function of our reactants and get the equilibrium constant. Or we could go all the way to calculate G for products and G for reactants and take the difference and convert that to K. We could do that either way. And I'll prove to that to you in a second with Excel. The equilibrium constant expressions you learned were approximations of the partition function. I think this is the funnest part of this whole, um, the whole three weeks that we've been working on, okay, is that you've been using concentrations in your equilibrium expressions, and those were really just stand-ins for the partition function. And that's why they fail sometimes. That's why your equilibrium constants aren't correct if you have like other than one molar solutions and so on. So the ones you look up in the table are typically room temperature, one molar solutions. And so that's when they've sort of been tweaked to give the actual concentration. But if you're at a different concentration, uh, then the equilibrium will be off. Okay. And then the same with the partial pressures. Okay. So it's your partial pressure compared to one atmosphere and it's a unitless quantity and it's to try to mimic that partition function. So there is a Kahoot online for that, but let's do um, let's do a top hat instead. I've got one little question for you. Let's see. And we'll turn that on. Okay. So gotta go through all this. All right. So let's check our terminology here. So when K equals 10 to the 35, which is some similar to some of the equilibrium constants you have in your labs, okay, where does the equilibrium lie? This is not a trick question, so just look through it. I just want to make sure that we are using the same kind of terminology in describing our equilibrium. All right, very good. 16 out of 16. Let's see what you think. All right, products dominate, equilibrium lies to the right. And that's correct. Okay, so the reason I ask this is one, just to get you to think about 10 to the 35 is way greater than one. And so that means that there are more products than reactants because it's a fraction. So if it's greater than one, the products, the numerator is large, the denominator is small, especially if it's 10 to the 35. That's a huge K. And so essentially you have, for every one reactant, you have 10 to the 35 products. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, so if you had 10 to the 35 anything is a lot. Okay, and think about water, right? So this hydrogen and oxygen making water is like similar to this, maybe like over 10 to the 100 or something like that. So you have that much water and you're going to search around and find 
the single hydrogen molecule <laughs> that's left, right? Because everything's water. And, and that's also why reactant, reactions slow down too, because they just get dominated by products and the reactants can't find each other. Okay, so let's play around with this in Excel a little bit. Let's see, let me go ahead and finish this out. Okay, I think I'm done. Here we go, and we'll turn Excel on, and then we'll go to Excel. Okay, so I've made an Excel spreadsheet that does all these problems for us, so we don't have to break our fingers with the pencils. Okay, and... Uh, and so we can zoom in on this. This is, do you understand kind of what I've got going here with the energy level diagram? I, it's sort of a cheap, I just underline those squares. Like I put some text in there and made it underline. Um, so here's our reactants, here's our products. The reactants, um, this is 2000 joules per mole. So this is 1000 joules per mole. And the ground state is not set at zero. The ground state, the zero one is over here on the product side. So just wanted to play around with it, give a give a strange little energy level diagram where the the reactant's lowest state is is uh, is at 1,000 joules per mole. Its excited state is at 2,000 joules per mole. Put it in contact with products that have degeneracy at 2,000 joules per mole and a ground state level at zero. And so we can calculate the partition function. So here's my energies: 1,000 and 2,000 singly degenerate everybody's fine with that yes and then the Boltzmann factor so you can look up here I'll double click to see the you know how it depends upon you've got GI in front which is D12 the energy divided by RT okay I say K here but we're in joules per mole so that's actually R okay so shouldn't be bothered by that okay and so here's our our partition function calculated 1.14 That's just the sum of the Boltzmann factors. And so now I can calculate my probabilities. I have a 60% chance of being in the lower state, 40% chance of being in the upper state. And then I can calculate all of my U-shag. So here's my internal energy, entropy. And again, it's, it is what it is. You calculate these numbers, but the real fun is when you have it in contact with something else. And so let's put it in contact with this one, where we have one singly degenerate level at, the, at zero, joules per mole, and then three at 2,000 joules per mole. Here's our partition function. Notice with the, um, with the excited state uh, being triply degenerate, our partition function went up quite a bit. We have a 57% chance of being in that excited state, 43% chance of being in the ground state. So the ground state went from 60% down to 43% because of that degeneracy. And so here's our U shag, again, not really very interesting, but let's calculate our delta U's. And so this says that the internal energy dropped going from left to right. So here's our reactants and products. So the way we draw these, that's why I was sort of connecting that forward equilibrium with the right side of the equation. So the right side dominates in this case, because it's um, a negative delta U, negative delta H, negative delta A, negative delta G. Uh, we have a positive entropy, and that really helps spontaneity, right? Because if we want a negative delta G, um, let's see, I don't know that I can, I don't think I can write on, on Excel. Oh, well, here it is. Um, notice that G, and then you can put deltas in front of all of these as well. So delta G is delta H minus T delta S. And we want, for spontaneous reactions, we want a negative delta G. So a positive entropy really helps. If entropy increases, that minus sign makes the TS negative and helps spontaneity. So positive in uh, increases in entropy really help drive spontaneous reactions. Now you can have negative entropies which work against your spontaneity, and that will still be spontaneous if delta H is big enough. And that's the case for the, for the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen to make water. If you think about that, you've got, really, you've got three gas phase molecules making two gas phase molecules. So you have two hydrogens and one oxygen molecule combining to make two water molecules. So we've lost moles of gas, and gas has the highest partition functions. 
translational motion. So we've lost a whole mole of gas. And so our entropy decreases when we burn hydrogen and oxygen to make water. But yet it's really spontaneous. It gives off an enormous amount of energy. That's how we get the space shuttle in the, into the atmosphere, is uh, hydrogen and, and, and oxygen. The, the main engines on the space shuttle provide a ridiculous amount of thrust. It was, even though the solid rocket boosters are the most impressive looking, those three little engines on the back of the space shuttle provided 60 to 70% of the thrust. So it was the hydrogen and oxygen that was coming out of those. You saw you didn't see much exhaust out of those because it was just, um, the flame was just blue and then you saw the condensation of the water later that make the big white cloud. Um, so a positive entropy change really helps spontaneity. A negative delta H really helps spontaneity. If you have a if you have a positive enough entropy change, you can get by with a with a positive en enthalpy, and that's an endothermic reaction. So you can have that happen as well. And we can maybe play around with this to see if we can get an endothermic reaction to be spontaneous. Okay, you want to do that? Okay. But let, so let's get down here. We have our deltas. Okay. And then here's our equilibrium constant. So I calculated it two ways. So I'll double click on this and you can see I did the, the exponential function of my delta G over R over T. Got that? Just like you would do in the lab. So once I have delta G, I just divide that by RT, better change the sign, okay? So it's minus delta G over RT. If delta G is already negative, you still have to take a minus, so it becomes positive. It's the biggest mistake is dropping that one negative when you have a negative delta G. You already see a negative there, and so you think you've already put the negative in, but you haven't yet. So it's, it's the exponential of negative delta G over RT. So that gives us a positive equilibrium constant. So it says it's twice as likely to be a product than a reactant in this system. Now look at this one. This is K using just the partition functions. You get exactly the same number. So that's a real shorthand way of calculating it. If you have two systems in contact with each other and you can calculate the partition function, all you got to do is take the ratio of those partition functions and you will get the equilibrium constant. And you will know if it's going to the right or staying on the left side. Okay. That's just really satisfying. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to raise that ground state energy. So let's move this one up. Let's try to make it endothermic. Move this one down. Okay, let's change our energies to zero here, and this one is now a thousand. I love Excel. We're done. <laughs> right? So it's it's endothermic. 1050. Okay, so it absorbed heat when it went to the to the reactant side, um, but it's slightly spontaneous. Okay, it's negative delta G and it has a positive or greater than one equilibrium constant. So this is a spontaneous reaction that's endothermic. Wow, oh, that's cool. That's why I like Excel too. Too bad you can't do this on the test, right? You just make this up and put your numbers in. Yeah. Can you show us the example? That's right. <laughs> this is how I make some of the exam problems, obviously. is very, very... Uh, Observing, I knew somebody would see that and go, hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll do it quickly. This is from 2014, yeah, 2018. So similar things, I'll give this, I'll print it off, and then you calculate these things, and then I check your work. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I might post it without the exam sheets on it, but <laughs> yeah, and so. Um, but yeah, this is, again, just using all of these equations, you shag, and your two or three level systems and playing around with it. I mean, again, if uh, I'm going to try to keep it to where it's doable in an exam, like I might give you all of these and then have you calculate just the products. So you, why make you do it twice? You know, I want you to finish. <laughs> right? I hate it when I get exams back and there's nothing to grade. <laughs> it's just like you got the first two and there's nothing. And I'm like, I can't even give partial credit. There's just nothing here. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll work with you. I'll give you half of the problem already done. You calculate the other half, do your deltas, tell me if it's endothermic, inter, you know, endergonic, and so on. Yeah, so let's look at this over here. Uh, so this is the previous one. So this is now endothermic. 
because it's heat, right? Heat of reaction, so endothermic. We're focused on the, and then this is exergonic. ERG is the um, sort of the root for energy. You hear this all the time when you talk about uh, ergonomics, you're talking about how you sit, how you stand, and so on, and maintaining your posture with the minimum energy. Like if your mouse is way over here, you're expending a lot of energy to to um, use your mouse. And so this is a minimum energy spot to have your elbows at 90 degrees and your mouse like this and so on. So, uh, so those are the two terms that we would also, vocabulary words that we would put uh, along with this. And so if you see a positive delta H, obviously it's endothermic. But that doesn't mean it's not spontaneous. It could be spontaneous. And how is this spontaneous? Why is this spontaneous? Well, look at S. S is still positive. Okay, so our delta S is positive. We've increased the entropy because of that triply degenerate excited state. So we have more levels to populate. So up here, this, um, this triply degenerate excited state right there, that increases our partition function and that increases our entropy. And so then that causes our entropy change to be positive. This entropy is 11.4 and this is 5.1. So almost twice the, well, more than twice the entropy in the products than we have in the reactants. Now, what is the, last minute, what is the thing that you can do in a reaction that will increase the entropy the most? So think about the partition functions. Entropies and partition functions are very closely related. So what can increase the partition function the most? Degeneracy, but let's let's think about now now macroscopic states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. Which of those states of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, is going to have the highest partition function? Yes. Gas. Thank you for such a strong result. Yes, <laughs> gases, right? So if your reaction generates gas, like a net increase in number of moles of gas, you really increase the entropy. And so almost all of your endothermic reactions that are spontaneous have a gaseous product because they're just driving that reaction forward. It can be endothermic, but because you're producing a gas, it's spontaneous, moving in the forward direction. And the famous one you see online is barium sulfate and um, something else. You mix it together. Oh, and uh, ammonium nitrate maybe, and it makes ammonia gas. And so the ammonia leaves, it really stinks but it makes a slurry and it's so cold, it'll freeze the beaker. So they get a wet beaker, they put it on a piece of wood and they stir this and it freezes the water in the wood. And then you pick the wood up with the beaker. So go online and look for that endothermic reaction chemistry demonstration. I'm, I'm like cheating. I'm just telling you to go find it online instead of doing it in class. But you really wouldn't want the ammonia in here. It's terrible. <laughs> right. So great, y'all have a great day.